Hey tribe, it's Bridget. Wearing the, oh, the O's tonight in shout out to the Little League World Series, which is going on. And our home state of Pennsylvania is actually actively playing Texas as we speak. So I wanted to give a little bit of Jersey love to our Little League World Series people. We're gonna be talking tonight about stories. We're gonna be talking about stories related to this piece and why we do so much research at Conte Lemire. Because we know that the front story can be very interesting, the story of the artist, the composition, the period. Um, but the backstory sometimes is what really brings the piece home into life. And the backstory may or may not include the provenance, the provenance being the chain of custody of the piece. The best provenance out there is going to be the provenance that starts with the actual hand and moment of the artist finishing, and then we'll go through to current day with no breaks. So you'll, you'll know when it was sold, who bought it, what gallery it was in. You'll know if it's been to um, art shows. You'll, you'll be able to find catalogs for that quite often, and you'll be able to sort of really understand the life of the piece. This is most commonly seen in original works from artists that are well known. That isn't to say that a lesser known artist won't have a chain of command for their work. It just may be much more difficult to find printed histories. So, You've got that piece of it. And to be honest with you, we're not going to be talking about provenance very much tonight other than what we just did. What we are going to be talking about is backstory. And the other part of the term backstory is, how does a piece become an artifact of either history, a relationship with someone famous, infamous, or a tool or a prop for something significant that may have happened? And that can be just as interesting as any study of provenance or of the front story. In fact, in some cases, it's more interesting. So we're gonna start with the front on this. First of all, it is titled, but we have yet to find the title on this piece. So if any of you know, I mean, we can say breaking a bad one, but there are a lot of pieces by this artist that actually reference Busting a horse. And so we're not really terribly sure if breaking a bad one is correct for any of them. So the artist for this currently untitled piece is from California. He was born in 1892 and he passed in 1972. His name is Stanley M. Long. Stanley Long actually did go to art school and did have a fairly prolific art career. He also, though, was a rancher. He grew up on a ranch. His key workload was bringing horses down from the pasture and getting them started to get them out to be working cattle horses. So a lot of his body of work is going to be related to what he knew. The bringing in of horses, the riding of horses, the working of cattle. And we know from the content that this is pretty reasonable that it's Stanley Long's work. Same content, same, same flow, um, and same use of watercolor in a like manner. Many of Stanley's planes were very, very yellowy um, with, with very, very limited skyline. So this Fit Stanley. It's kind of a fingerprint for him. Of course, it's helpful that we actually also have his signature and his date that the watercolor was created, which is 1950. But what you may have heard is that the last thing you do is trust a signature. You're looking at everything in total before you, you say, yes, that's a signature. Um, and we are pretty much, to be honest with you, done at this point talking about the front story. We are going to take a moment and take a visit into the concept of American Western art 
because it's one of the few types of art that really isn't an art genre. So American Western art can be called American frontier art. It can be called cowboy art. And it it is alike in that the topic is all the same, but the, the style doesn't have to be. So you can have a very abstract or a very realistic and all of those other things in the middle, as long as they have the topics that relate to the American West. You're gonna see a lot of horses, a lot of Western saddles, a lot of cowboy hats, a lot of cows, many plains, many prairies, some little little log cabinies, usually with a horse and a cow floating around. And the fascinating thing about this grouping of art, it's, it started about 1850, and it was really designed to get people to head out to the West. The Homestead Acts were happening. There was availability of land and they wanted to get people to come out to the beauty and the romance and the adventure of the West. And this was a wonderful way to encourage that. And it is still a, a, a form that we see today. Um, Western art goes up and down in popularity, but it has never really left. People love the romance of the West. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the art. We talked about the fact watercolor was this particular artist's medium of choice. This isn't a watercolor. This is actually a print. And between 1950 and 1975, there were a significant number of organizations that sprang up and they started dealing in what we call art accessories. Um, for instance, Turner Manufacturing in Chicago, Illinois was one of them. And what they would do is they would go to a fairly known artist or to open market classic art that was no longer under patent or copyright. And they would take the image that they were allowed to use and they would mass produce it and they would then sell them either in a catalog or at local stores for a fairly reasonable price. As long as you had a nail in a wall, you could go get this image and you had something pretty to put on your wall. It is likely that this particular print was ordered out of a catalog from one of those companies. And we know the print was done initially in 1950, and that those companies all pretty much were out of business by 1975. So that means, and we know that 1972, Mr. Long had passed. So we can say somewhere between 1950 and 1972, Mr. Long agreed to let that be a print. It was created, it was placed into a catalog, other than regular individual homes, Catalogs were open to offices, they were open to hotels, they were open to stores. Anyone could buy any number of the prints. And there was a hotel in Wyoming that decided that they wanted to augment their Western theme by buying a lot of Western prints. They were cheap, they were plentiful. And that is how this piece most likely got to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And to be honest with you, we're going to take a moment and take a breather from this piece. And we're going to do a little bit of Cheyenne history. Because if you don't understand that, you won't get the backstory very clearly. Cheyenne, Wyoming is the capital of Wyoming. Wyoming is very geographically large, but with not too many people. Cheyenne is 30 miles from Denver, Colorado. Cheyenne has, as does every state and national capital, buildings that are specifically dedicated to government. But FYI, government doesn't just happen in the buildings or in the government business hours. In most places that have government, it might be a bar, it might be a hotel, it could be some other form of an establishment there is a place outside of the government area where people congregate. Lobbyists lobby, po politicians do politicky things, and 
Deals are struck, bargains are made over a drink and a handshake. There was one hotel in Cheyenne called The Hitching Post. It was started in 1925. And there was a very savvy owner who in 1950 told all of the political people in the state of Wyoming that if they came to Cheyenne to do business, they could stay at his hotel for $5. And that is how the Hitching Post became the second capital building of Cheyenne or the Western White House, as it was also called. So you had politicians that and lobbyists who flocked to the Hitching Post, and during the 50s and the 60s and into the early 80s, you had individuals who were coming in from around the country when they needed to court the Wyoming vote. The Hitching Post, which is the hotel that bought this image, probably from a catalog, hung it up somewhere in their property, had five presidents and one vice president between 1951 and 1982 who stayed at the, at the hotel. Those presidential people included Richard Nixon. They included John and Bobby Kennedy. They stayed there twice, 1960 and 1968. You had Dwight Eisenhower, Harry Truman, and in 1982, the last president, Ronald Reagan. There were also a large number of entertainers and other musicians who came and stayed at the Hitching Post. You had um, George and Gracie Burns, who were a com comedic married couple uh, with their own television show. You had George Thurgood and the Destroyers, a great band who actually not only stayed at the Hitching Post while they were doing a gig somewhere else, they actually wound up doing a kind of impromptu concert in the Hitching Post. You had uh, a number of the stars who went on to do the movie Heaven's Gate. And, you know, if you had to be in Cheyenne and you were somebody, you were at the Hitching Post. At least you were until 2010. In 2007, the owner of the $5 room passed away. And it went to a series of owners who then decided they were going to actually renovate the property and make it better. Apparently, part of their renovation plans included setting fire to the hitching post. They were uh, convicted of arson, uh, two-thirds of the property basically burned, and it left a number of outbuildings and uh, court-type hotel rooms that had not been physically attached to the main building standing. The Hitching Post used, sold again, used those remaining buildings to actually conduct business until 2021 when they were demolished due to safety. So you have this piece. We know it was in a place where a lot of interesting people came through the doors and a lot of interesting history occurred. Um, one of the sadder moments for history was that Bobby Kennedy, who was with his brother John Kennedy at the Hitching Post in 1960 and then came back in 1968, left the Hitching Post and headed to California for a campaign stop. Two weeks later, he was assassinated. Um, if this piece was around Bobby Kennedy, that's a big statement. That's a big deal. So what we do is we are now working with the folks who are still around, who knew the Hitching Post well, to figure out where did this piece sit? Because we've got clues on the back. We have property of the Hitching Post written. We have numbers written that are three and four digits. They could be room numbers. They could be skewed numbers from wherever the piece was purchased. And we want to figure it out before we put it on the market and send it to its new forever wall. 
Art doesn't always tell you every story right away. And every story you see isn't going to be on the front. So, when you're looking at a great piece of art, make sure you're looking at both the front and the back. Pieces will give you hints all throughout them. You just need to start taking the time to try and figure out what those hints are telling you. And if you get absolutely flummoxed, you can always send a picture of the front and the back to us at our website and we can try and help give you tips or even work with you to do some research on the piece for you. But remember, every piece of great art deserves its forever wall and every story that can be told related to that piece of art deserves to be told. On that, have a great evening. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight. If you know the title to this guy, please fire it off to us and we will catch you next time. Bye bye. Say what you need to say. Say what you need to say.